This game is without a doubt going to be the oldest one I might ever cover on the channel. It's been a long time coming, having never done one Nintendo game. And what better one to do for the first than the one that changed the industry? A common statement said about many games, but when you look at Ocarina of Time and the history of gaming, it's easy to see it as everything that came before it and everything that came after. And I can't lie, being a 2000s baby Sony pony, I've never played Ocarina. I know, I know, calm down. I know what you're gonna be thinking watching this video. How did you know how to put this all together? I had excellent health. I have a wonderful friend named Justin who helped me through it all. Him being born in 1992 made him the exact age I'm sure many of you were when you first played it. So this script will bounce back and forth talking from his experience growing up with the game and my experience playing it as an adult gamer boy. And trust me, even though I'm only playing it for the first time now, there is no escaping how iconic many of the moments are and the music is. I've been gaming long enough to have my own strange nostalgia for it. But enough prelude. Let's gush together just about how great Ocarina of Time is. This opening menu just floods with nostalgia, possibly more than any other game out there. Just the calming Ocarina whistling us into this beautiful new world, while Link and all his 3D polygonal self rides the countryside of Hyrule looking for his next adventure. And there's a bit of a spoiler too, at least for those that didn't read the back of the box, seeing an old Link on this horse, and then you start as young Link. When we get in, makes you wonder, what? How are we gonna get old the f And you all know I love when games make us excited and question what's going to happen. Love when we press start, we are slowly drawn into the Kokiri Forest where we first meet Link. The most important source of any child, and for that matter, adults, endless entertainment reading the dialogue. It's very important that you pick a serious name such as My Dude or I Farted. I thought it would get old. That shit never got old. Kokiri, when translated from kanji, basically is children of the trees. Ko meaning child and Kiri meaning trees, hence Kokiri. Off the rip, we're shown our big bad, and the nightmare is made even more frightening as Leek doesn't have any of his weapons, as he will later. Dreams are often representative of our inner thoughts and feelings, and though he's the Triforce of Courage, he's been isolated with the Kokiri and has yet to figure out what he's truly capable of, making him dream himself even more defenseless than he will be when we get mopped but later by him anyways. And it's also the classic Enmudia Res, giving us excitement to look forward to before running around looking for rupees for 10 minutes. The source of life. Who inhabits the forest? Children that never age. A roundabout way of saying that it is children in our childhoods that are the source of life. A huge theme of the game being of innocence and growing up. Why is it Link's destiny? Because of a prophecy and all that, but also because Link receives a Triforce of Courage and only someone with that amount of courage will be able to take down Ganondorf. We gotta place ourselves back in 1998. This whole shot of flying through the childlike playground home of the Kokiri all of the 3D elements, characters living their lives from Navi's POV. It was really something to behold for the first time when holding a controller that looked like this in a room that might have looked like this. No wonder when you want to go outside and play mom. We had something special here. And the comedy of the name starts, my dude. <laughs> Even later, Ganon feels like our mate because of this. Most every game after Ocarina has taken influence from it. Like Skyrim with this line here. My God, was I kind of blown away playing this for the first time. I know the Switch port looks better than the OG, but it holds up incredibly well in its own charming as hell way. Notice that he says not a real man. That'll be coming up a lot, so just remember that bit. The hell can I even say? Toru Asawa knew the limitations of the hardware, and hell, I'd even say that Ocarina is an amazing game because of its limitations. What do you do when you can't rely on voice acting or physical performance and even a crazy amount of counter work? Sound, effects, and music. These are two of the three pillars that Ocarina stand on to be seared into all of our memories. This soundbite is in who knows how many other pieces of media. And of course, who can forget Link ushering in the habit of us breaking every little crate and vase in every game ever? <laughs> Ah, the spam sound effects like this. So many weird staples our goblin brain started here. Mido really just mad that we stole his girl without him being a real man. Our first enemies are right outside the dying Deku tree. Its influence is fading and hostile creatures are slowly encroaching upon the village. It's using all its power to protect the centuries old kids. To gain the Triforce or even a piece of it, one must be balanced with all three or in tune with one. Link's gotta prove himself through the first three dungeons, and does so even without the Triforce of Curse, because Link is my dude! 3D was of course the N64's whole thing, and with that came the endless possibility of using verticality to accentuate level design. And I'll be the one to tell you that this is a blessing and a curse. Looking at you, Water Temple. It did create the funny adage, if you're stuck, look up. Definitely happened to me many times. And to really show off what this new 3D world was totally capable of, we're given the Great Deco Tree as our first level, where we've gotta climb, jump, and platform around. Until the big, 
How was I supposed to know I could do that moment of jumping through the webs from higher up to gain more momentum? Yes. I died to the plants. You all know I'm not good at games. Nintendo does push us to learn these new mechanics many times through game design, such as placing the heart here to their credit. I can't act like Ocarina was the end-all be-all of 3D pioneering because we had other ones like Battlezone and more importantly Mario 64, but it just did everything amazingly. Even the menus are 3D-ish. So well, that's why it doesn't feel terrible coming back to play it all these years later. It looks and feels just as good as most modern games when it comes to exploring a 3D space. We can talk about the camera later. <laughs> <laughs> I laugh every time I'd hear Link scream from a high fall, and you know you did too. You think sliding through thin passageways was an annoying contrivance in God of War or Jedi Fallen Order? Think again. It's always been here, b****. You may notice that I do get shot from the side, but this is a rare occurrence. Nintendo knew that through the limitations of Z-Log, they need to turn down enemy attack frequency to next to zero as to avoid a frustrating experience. That coupled with the fact that they wanted the encounters to often feel like sword fights, it was important to keep that one-on-one -on -one experience, which feels at best when fighting enemies with a sword or axe. It's like a dance that reminds me of Dark Souls fights. Or did Dark Souls fights now remind me of this? Okay, that's horrifying. Just hearing it slink around, not knowing where to tell, figuring out the good old look up trick. To be greeted with this gangrene Sauron. <laughs> Y'all eyeballs when you heard I never played this before. Can we talk about monster design right fast? Because holy sh**. I'm in love with it. Each one is so unique and different from the last that I'm always on the edge of my seat excited to finally see what they look like and what the next fight's gonna be. And like any great boss fight, mother throws ads at us. Playing this really makes me realize as a spry 23 year old that nothing really changes, does it? Ganon's side profile is so iconic from this game that any of his squashed variants just look wrong. Yeah, from the front, he looks like a goofball, but we don't need to talk about that. Dude just screams, I'm a dope bad guy, and that's why he's my most played character on Smash Ultimate. That, and taking the stock and three hits never gets old. King of Evil? <laughs> More like, come back, King! Before time began... There was the cube. So before the goddesses, there was practically nothing, but this label as chaos. I love the idea that without nature, without life, that's all that's left senselessness, and I do mean it more as unconscious, as in without a conscious, not knocked out. To not be aware of oneself and the world around you can only beget chaos. We've seen what happens to people who don't have a conscience or just an unclear one. Terrible things. Ganon is a reflection of this unconscious mind, one whose greed and desire for power slowly reverts the world back to its chaotic state, a state without life, without nature, and that's what as Link we try to restore. Not just the world physically, but people's conscious mind. We do it many times throughout Little Ways too, like curing the Goron's depression and saving Grog from being lost in the woods. These two instances are proof that you don't have to be a strong, powerful warrior that can defeat the king of evil to make a difference. Sometimes it's as simple as looking out for someone who's lost their way, and that goes for the physical and the emotional. Kinda crazy that Oscar statues are what created this world. And just like in our world, it was fire that created what we've evolved into. Fire is everything. It is life, light, and stands to reason to be the first ingredient to create this world. Breaking the sound barrier and creating taxes. I'm about it. At the end of creation is Feror, who made the land flourish. And it's Link later, who holds the Triforce of Courage, i.e. Feror, who makes the land thrive once again. The first step of Link's loss of innocence is basically losing his father. He was left at the Great Deku Tree by his wounded mother to be cared for by him, combined with the weight of the world being placed on his shoulders. <laughs> this was too funny not to highlight. My boy's gotta be wearing hover boots. Let's not all forget all the inspirations dropped from Peter Pan, direct and indirect. We've got kids in every age, fairies that help out, live in the woods, Link has a pointy hat, wears green. You could say that the Kokiri is one English love interest away from identity theft. <laughs> Good thing Nintendo ate Peter Pan instead of the other way around. Nintendo does not mess around when it comes to copyright. Let's see if you ever be able to see this video. Woo! It's the name of the games, finally! The music for getting the ocarina is quite different from the other times we receive items. It's not a giant fanfare, more subdued. This is a bittersweet moment between two lifelong friends as Link departs and the music respects that and takes a step back. Though we don't get much facial animations or physical ones, just through the lingering push in from the camera and the empty wide, we can feel her pain watching Link go. And another layer of innocence lost, having to leave behind a friend for work. Sorry, sounds more harsh than it is. Leaving your friend because your purpose demands you must. There we go. Oh my god, this game has poppin'. It's just like the Spider-Man 2 gameplay reveal. Both 0 to 10 trash games. 
can't believe developers making the games of our dreams would allow such a minor thing that we're all going to forget about in two seconds, get through testing, and we should rip them apart for it. But yeah, that puddle did look really sexy in the original Spider-Man's release trailer. The owl here really is just warning us about the camera in the water temple. This is when we all knew we were in for something different. The huge map in the bottom right, cresting this hill to see the giant Hyrule Castle. Environments like this just didn't exist before Ocarina. It also pioneered the old, you see that mountain? You can climb it. Or something to that effect. Seeing distant locations and having that be our motivation for exploration. Just like a childlike curiosity. What's over there? Oh my god, I can go there? And we are constantly rewarded by our exploration. Hearts, fairies, magic. None of it necessary, but if you want to survive these dungeons and temples, you bet your ass I'm going to go to the cow house and move some boxes. And holy shit. This castle actually has people in it with things to talk about, quests and shops. We have other things to do besides main missions or quests laid out for us now. I know I'm being a little overzealous with that statement. There were other games to do this, including previous Zelda games, but it's a completely different experience played in this way. The level of immersion is just like, and I'll keep saying it, nothing we'd ever seen before. My girl in the back's got some moves. What are you calling fairy boy? Once again, our age is being pointed out. <laughs> Even 20 years ago, we were making the dad went out to get milk and never came back jokes. You know what? I don't even blame Talon's Mario looking ass and need a nap. Ingo seems like a handful. <laughs> I love all these goofy animations. Even as an adult, they make me chuckle. Maybe Assassin's Creed took a little bit too much inspiration from Ocarina? Not having a crouch button for stealth and all that? Maybe some things should stay in the past, like one joystick. The one great thing about having your entire console run on almost solely first party titles is that you can constantly throw in fun Easter eggs like Talon in this window. I mean, hell, we literally throw an Easter egg at Talon, who is a nod to Mario. Let me show you my cock. My friend Justin, who was playing the section, said immediately. One of my favorite parts of the Zelda games is that Link isn't some king or destined to rule benevolently. I can't imagine his tax policy with how he gets those rupees. He's just a guy being my dude trying to save the day for no other reason than doing the right thing. Then goes back to just his day. The most powerful object in the world is barred by the stones that represent all life. If it's life that protects something that is the most powerful thing in the world, then what's really the strongest object in the world? A little magic wish or the preservation of the natural order of things? Oh, oh, we read the thing. That's not creepy at all. Totally looks like a nice guy that would swear fealty to a king. Courageous boy. About time we're getting some respect, but we're still a boy. <laughs> the first song out of the Ocarina is for Zelda, which I find just super cute with their fates being so entwined. I've waited this long to truly talk about the music because if I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it right. This song and Song of Storms are among the two most iconic melodies in all of gaming. And I do wanna stress melody. No other game has ever had so many memorable melodies. Yes, it was important to get that right since the whole game is based on the music. And how impressive is it that we have 13 super memorable melodies, but just five notes across them. Koji Kondo gave us a masterclass on how to develop a memorable melody and how to implement them into a game as to remember them while never getting annoying or old. Because some music starts awesome, but after the 15th hour of hearing it, it can get rough. Never an issue here. I could listen to this till the day Blizzard becomes a good company again, and we all know that's not happening. I'll talk more about the music and the other songs as they crop up and mechanics are introduced. Just when we thought it couldn't get any better, we're thrown in this overhead angle like we're back playing A Link to the Past. Our songs also start simple as we're just learning them and also Link is young and not all big brain and developed yet. Another challenge for Koji Kondo, making sure not just the melodies are memorable, but also the button presses to the players don't have to pull up the screen all the time to see the song. I was baffled at the amount of times Justin was able to just run up to a spot and bing, bang, boom, boom, out a song before I even blinked. And like any good game designer, giving us an easy backtrack. Should it work? Does it make sense? I don't know, and I don't care because it's fun. The second you enter Goron City, retreated to a completely different vibe of music from everything we've heard. We've got almost solely percussion with some chanting. Judging by how much they pound their chests, I think it tracks. Each race is given their own respect of their music and is another reason why it doesn't get old. It's constantly shifting depending on where we are. An absolute unit. See everybody, all it takes is a little song and dance to cure you of being peeved. Depressed, music. Angry, music. And that's just great. All those cuts had me dying for a second. I was just like, oh, I just pissed them off. 
He's also the cutest little dancer I've ever seen for being such a big boss. And Link just slowly backing away. <laughs> Why didn't no one force me to play this sooner? See how we got to prove we're a real man now? All of the sages are each a measure of Link's progression into adulthood. Until we finally reach the Master Sword and get big. But more on that later. Anyone who's played this game since childhood always has to take the stakes and show off some fun speedrun tech they do in all their playthroughs. And this is just one of many. I'm sure you all got that one friend, right? Each of the dungeons are all nature based on the three goddesses. The Deku Tree, this cavern of rock, which also looks to be just some old dead creature, and Jabu Jabu. I'm getting Sin's fortress non-flashbacks just looking at these dudes. Something deliberated over was if Link should have a dedicated jump button, and hot damn, I'm glad they didn't. Never having to worry about mistiming a jump was a godsend, especially considering the camera can be a pain. Really streamlines the experience of what the real focus is, and that being the puzzles. Just like the Deco Tree and later in Jabu, each of these dungeons hint towards what the final boss is gonna be. No better feeling of progress than being able to look down and see where you started, am I right? So the camera in Ocarina was truly the first of its kind. Not having a second stick and the D-pad being out of reach, they had to come up with something new. Z-targeting was the solution and after getting used to it, it's honestly not that bad. It becomes second nature and you can control just as well as any other game. I mean, look at Dark Souls. You're constantly using your thumb to roll around and sprint. So unless you're using the claw, you're gonna be using Z-targeting or what Ocarina pioneered and it's still present in many games, the good old lock-on. God, it's really blowing my ass that the DNA of Ocarina is found in just about every other game out there. Once again, our final boss is another creature based on one that's been corrupted by Ganon that Link needs to purify. This will trend going forward with all bosses. We've got to use the tactics we just got very comfortable with throughout the dungeon to take them down. It makes us feel like we have a chance and a direction on what exactly to use against them. That and Nabi telling us. The next step for Link is brotherhood, a sense of belonging and inclusivity, transcending races. At the end of the day, everyone just wants to belong, right? <laughs> the fourth wall dialogue has got jokes and also alludes to Link's naivete. <laughs> Cooties, no! <laughs> Let us not forget the secret of milk. That scream mixed with what I'm seeing makes me very confused. You know damn well the Great Fairy was someone's first sexual awakening. And how awkward. You're playing Zelda, defeating Lizardmen, and solving puzzles, but of course, that's the part when mom walks in. Is this why everyone attacks every chicken in every game? Trauma for this whack attack Nintendo threw at us? Nintendo doesn't really let up at all throughout Ocarina, giving us some really interesting character and creature designs. And also great order from fiery rock to, I guess, slimy water since we're inside of Jabu more than in the water <laughs> how nice of him to move he's getting there he's moving no way Nintendo's gonna make us watch all this right okay yep they are good one guys Good one. So Ocarina of Time can be very obtuse sometimes on how to progress. And you've got to think the amount of kids playing this. If adults struggle to figure out, imagine their dismay. How are we to know that we can fill bottles, let alone put a fish in it and also drop it later? And it swings almost so far in the opposite direction of how hand-holding modern games have become to a point of frustration. There is also grace in that though, because once you do figure it out, there's no better feeling of accomplishment. And also things like this just make the game longer, which surprisingly Ocarina doesn't have any issue with, even if you know absolutely everything to do. This is a big game that only takes out 32 megabytes on the cartridge. Just think about that for a second. The meme clips I've been using in this video take up more space than that. It's obvious why it's so small, but it's impressive as hell to think about the scope of this game in that context. You know, of all the games I've played, it seems like Kingdom Hearts took the most inspiration from this game. Remember Monstro? Even down to the sound effects. I swear I heard some here and there that just straight up ended up in Kingdom Hearts. Ocarina really does have a lot of girl bosses. I bet if this game was released today, we'd be hearing so many men whining that women here undermining Link's importance. Blah, 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 blah. And all men in here are either idiots or evil. My point being, I love how strong the women are in this game on their own merits, especially ending with Zelda. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, maybe that wasn't the best clip to put over that line, but hey, she's a kid. Kids make mistakes. If we're being real, Jabu's level is super gross. Between the sound effects being all squishy and watching the walls warp. Ugh. Makes a statement, though. Just like all things seem to do in Ocarina. Memorable. For the final spirit stone, it doesn't get any more natural than being inside a creature. <laughs> but why Princess Ruto? I prefer to believe this is just Link's inner dialogue now on. To emulate the breathing and living nature of Jabu, instead of painstakingly trying to make the walls, floor, and ceiling breathe, Nintendo just said, fuck it, throw a keyframe warp filter over it all and call it a day. And it works, 100%. 
Oftentimes, the best solution is the easiest one. So this boss, put delicately, we gotta spread and clap them cheeks using our trusted new mechanic in the boomerang. To round out the nature bosses, we've got this monstrosity. And I love for once, I can use that word and just mean it in the purest sense of the definition. My brain is struggling to comprehend what I'm looking at, but I'm gonna kill it nonetheless. Ocarina has a really great progression with this boss. Starting small and simple, just using the new mechanic introduced, but then slowly making us mix new and old ones until later when they're throwing completely new things that you mid fight like the Ganon paintings or Dark Link. Maybe it was a little too harsh, the walls do move. Sounds about right. Girls are mean to boys when they have a crush on them, right? Right? Oh, what? Girls never beat you up in elementary school? Couldn't have been me. I was a stud back then. <laughs> I'm kidding. In fifth grade, I asked a girl for a number, and when I called, it was the rejection hotline. We keep getting these dialogues about Link not knowing shit and continues to hammer home that he really is just a kid. The next level for Link to experience on growing up is love and matrimony. Baby boy's first girlfriend, if you will. These things, people, were a godsend. Let me tell you. Never go without your fairy friends, friends. Oh, Boy, I think I remember this. We're finally caught up. Even Ganon recognizes Link's courage. Link has now faced the greatest evil in the world and for the first time has to watch someone die in front of his eyes. Imagine what that'll do to a child. And seeing death firsthand like this is a complete loss of innocence for Link. The world is not squeaky clean like he thought growing up in the forest where no one does. And perfect that after seeing this, we practically lose our childhood and we're forced to grow up way too soon. Now this is a classic view. One, because it's the Temple of Time, but also because it's not a 3D environment and man does it stick out, but it's got its charm. Arm. I had to let all that play. 100% my favorite track in the game. So regal and yet mysterious. It's understated to give respect to the sacred realm and feels like no other place in the game. When I listen to the music in Ocarina of Time, it really transports me to another world. I think that is what's been missing in most modern games. There's one here and there that pulls it off like Elden Ring, but it's not often. Beyond all the new 3D, the camera limitations, the amazing innovations, it comes down to the magic that we all felt and understood when we played this as a kid. Walking in the Temple of Time, we knew this place was something different. This song makes me think of my experience with games as a kid. Going to school to talk with friends about where they're at at the game and be like, oh, did you make it to the Temple of Time yet? Or if you get stuck, your only option was to ask friends or people you knew who had done it already. You couldn't just look up a guide online. You had to lean on others to get through. Just like how Link couldn't do any of this alone, many of us damn well couldn't have done this alone alone as kids. A moment for me that's burned into my mind was playing Return of the King on the PS2 and my dad had his shirt off and very seriously put on a bandana on his head, took the controller away from me and beat the King of the Dead. And all those feelings of bewilderment and also the silly feeling of, damn, I should have known that. It's moments like that that are all over Ocarina and that could only happen because we didn't have all the world's knowledge in our pockets. The physical sense of community that Ocarina created among friends was unreal and why it's remembered so fondly because it's not just the memories you made while playing, it's the memories you made in your life. What were you going through when you beat the first boss? Was mom and dad doing good while I wasn't in the water temple? Did Justin move away before you could tell him about the Temple of Time? Ocarina is a beautiful game today, but for all of us, our experience with it marks a time in our lives that we'll always remember. Something that tragically, at the end of the game, no one can offer Link. A little hint that you have to use the Master Sword for the final hint against Ganon. Your slingshot, and gonna cut it. Just like that, we're all grown up. Nothing else to say yet other than it kind of shocked me because I completely forgot that we were going to get big eventually. Yep, Navi. I think seven years really has passed. It is terrifying to walk into the market for the first time, a place once bustling with life and dancing, now rebel and decay. And we can assume these are the old citizens that we now have to put down. It's a cruel thing for a child to have to experience what the world truly is, and the second Link is old, he has to contend with it firsthand. It's why we had to wait seven years. To truly be the hero of time, he does have to be older. He needs to be able to understand the meaning and weight of things. Something obviously pointed out that Young Link didn't understand when talking to some of his friends. And talk about traumatizing your kid audience. <laughs> So this time paradox has been the big debate forever with Ocarina. He doesn't know Link when we're a child and played it, and when we go back in time. So right now, he just remembers it as some boy. Teaches it to older Links, so when we go back to, as a kid, we know how to and can play it for him. Time is linear for Link and his memories, but it isn't for everyone else. Which is why at the end, everyone forgets the great deed and sacrifice Link made. Now Ganon's corruption has gone beyond just creatures in nature, and has moved on to man and mankind's creation. If he's to dominate Hyrule, it has to be in every aspect. And this thing is just up. Even more depressing with this time jump, Link's childhood home is now desolate with monstrous plants growing in it with no idea where his friends are, possibly feeling like he failed them for being in stasis for seven years. I guess I haven't mentioned the iconic forest music. The quick notes and the melody of the ocarina combined to create a feeling of whimsy and childlike fun and playtime, perfect for the Kokiri kids. 
Now that we're older and the world is falling apart, this maze isn't as easy with the overhead camera. In this new world, we've got to watch our own backs. A threat could come from anywhere. The new perspective makes Link's battle feel even more difficult with Ganon now being in control. What a beautiful line. This is easily just talking about Link's seven years in stasis, but it's about memories and how we choose to live our everyday lives. Depending on how you spend the time you have on this earth, it can fly by or crawl. It's why time feels faster as we age, as we have less meaningful new experiences versus as when we were a child. It's why those memories of younger days always feel so nostalgic and beautiful. Then this is shown in game when we play Saria's song for Mido. Yo, this music battle is fire! All right, ladies and gents, it's starting. It's temple time. It's puzzle time. It's run around for two hours because I missed one key and can't remember where I've been and where I haven't. These were the sword fights I was talking about earlier that I love so much. It feels like a dance where you're doing everything you can to snag the little opening you're given. This hall made me more motion sick than VR, which is kind of crazy. Mission accomplished, Nintendo? I like that this first temple has everything turned on its head. Link's world just got twisted and turned upside down, and that's reflected in this temple. Link's first thing he does out of stasis is also heading home, checking on him, cleansing the place where he grew up. Also really dig that our weapons are different between young Link and old Link, especially the shield. Too big as a kid, so we just bend over and use it as a turtle shell. Like seriously, some of this stuff is crazy. What kid is going to shoot arrows into paintings to progress the temple? I'm a grown-ass adult and was blown away when I figured it out. Why is me complaining a win? Because Ocarina challenged you to think, to actually puzzle solve and not just move an energy cell somewhere or have your boy tell you how to complete it. I want to say they just don't make games like this anymore. And that'd be pretty dumb because like Tears of the Kingdom exists, but we can only do so many simple ass shrines before we start missing the water temple. It's another reason why we always come back to Ocarina. If Ocarina holds our hands anywhere, then it's with the exhaustive amount of controls text. And with the jump to 3D, it's pretty necessary considering the main audience of the game. And Navi's great at giving us little tips on how to take down certain enemies. So Nintendo doesn't leave us completely in the dark. You may have noticed I haven't talked about puzzles like at all. I wanted to wait for the temples because that's when they start getting really good. They are honest to goodness puzzles. Just a room with a bunch of things and Nintendo whispering through that you're a fuzzy CRT. Go figure it out, stupid. <laughs> they had us in the first half, not gonna lie. Just like with puzzles, this is also where the bosses start getting really creative. Yes, we have to use the bow. We just got at the start of this, but then you just have to figure out that we can hit projectiles back. This game is an onslaught of aha moments and feeling accomplished instead of frustrated that the game never told you. Don't get me wrong, those moments still exist, but the winds are so high you don't really mind the worst moments. Phantom Ganon fights us almost exactly the way real Ganon does, which is a nice touch. Ganon still belittles us as a kid, even though we big now. Bad guy doing good bad guy things. Ganon be like, Well, no art of passing skill. This moment combined with this one sets up the bittersweet ending that Link finds. She will always be our friend, whether she remembers us or not, whether we go back to Kokiri Forest or not. Link now has to purify not just one area and some creatures, but entire biomes. And just look how cute this little deco tree and his little straw in his mouth. Mind equals. I gotta say it again. So silly going from, you gotta save Hyrule to my dude. Another aspect of Ocarina is it has a very strong sense of place with each of the temples. You see one frame from any of them and you know exactly which one you're at. Kind hint towards their growing friendship that comes in right at the end to defeat Ganon. Now that we're older and have more responsibility, our songs have gotten more complicated to reflect that. That's why Darunia is the real one, recognizing us when Soraria cannot. I know the Kokiri don't grow up and that's actually why she didn't, but only felt as familiar. Entry whatever to the list of don't stick your Kratos in that. In broad strokes, the temples are quite similar in the way of they are just huge puzzle gauntlets and I don't actually see the point in winning each and every little cool puzzle element. We've all played them. We all know the puzzles and explorations are great. Rest assured, I will be talking about some of the good moments with these puzzles. So before you comment, he didn't mention my favorite part of X Temple. That's probably why. Anyways, the forest temple had a hub and spoke structure to the design. The fire temple is more of a tree with the central linear path and branches off that. This similar structure allowed more room for us to breathe with the sheer greater amount of platforming and just obstacle courses. And these two temples match their biome wonderfully. The forest with its fog and maze you can get lost in is reflected in the temple with its trick painting, trick boss, and backtracking interconnectedness. The fire temple is set in a giant volcano with wide rooms you must traverse in explosive enemies and obstacles. Not to mention the dragon at the end. <laughs> Love a good old mimic, right? Cute that after we knock the fire dancer down, it's just this tiny little ball. Is this a metaphor to how many bad guys are truly just overcompensating for their own insecurities, or is that just a neat new enemy? I don't know, you f pick. Hey, the Megaton Hammer. Loki loved this weapon. Not as cool as the Bigoron Sword, 
but the utility provides was unmatched. Don't you just love when a game teases the end goal right in your face at the start of a level? Just for you to do the most to get around a gate? Because that's what the Fire Temple is, <laughs> and I kind of loved it. It's not the type of dragon a stupid westerns expected. Volvagia follows the eastern depiction of dragons, which, maybe because it's less familiar to me, I find way cooler with their serpentine body. And hilariously, if you think about it, Nintendo gave us a hammer. We've got a monster popping up out of holes. They turned a dragon fight into a game of whack-a-mole. <laughs> and for some added complexity, the second phase of the fight adds those falling rocks we loved so much blocking as a kid. I mean, like, literally, as young Link. I'm sure we all hated them before figuring out to buy the Hylian shield. Now that's just cool, okay? Seeing us as a real man. Out of the fire and into the... ice. Now that's just great juxtaposition. The Ice Caverns is such a liminal space when it comes to the dungeons and temples of the game. The actual definition being that of a transitional space. Not the creepy images with scary music you see on YouTube. The Ice Cavern almost splits the game in half and forces us to use all the knowledge and tools we've gained to this point to progress through it. Our favorite item! Yes! Oh my god! If it wasn't clear yet, this game's theme is about time and what it does to us and how it never changes, but we do. Such a perfect game for us growing up. And like I keep saying, even now, to remember time while not trying to spend our entire lives trying to conquer it. Thanks, Faulkner. The main melody of the Serenade of Water gradually rises. Like the water, we rise later. Reaching too hard? No, whatever. We made it, friends. The heart and soul of Ocarina. The temple to end all temples. The place we all remember the most for the worst reasons, and it's a great lesson to learn as kids, that of patience, because f going in and out of the menus constantly, like seriously. Thank you 3DS version for making it an item. And also to teach kids that if you really want to be remembered, either be a hero like Link, or just really suck a lot like the Water Temple, and people will bitch about you on their deathbed. This temple is massive and unforgiving, where Nintendo finally took the gloves off and really made you think, and if you're really smart, plan. This temple's headaches comes from the sheer amount of options and backtracking needed if you miss something or forgot about a room. If you plan accordingly and comb the temple room by room by floor, it's much more manageable. But who really has the attention span to do all that? Certainly not kids, and certainly not me and Justin when we were playing through this. So this dungeon even today with almost 100 games played just for the channel alone took the longest. And I'm glad I could finally say I suffered through all this pain like all of you did. Trauma bond with me, my brethren. Now comparing the water temple to the previous one, we had the hub and spoke, the linear branches, and now we've got the fuck you and fuck you twice temple. Where does it fall in the player's progression of gameplay? I guess we've got to use the most equipment items to progress, or... At least feels that way with the constant boot swapping. Forces us much more like the ice caverns to use every tool we've got. Doesn't it just feel great getting the compass before the map? Like, just the most useful thing ever. The temple really does impress, though, just through the sheer scale and verticality. Once again, for Nintendo's second foray into the 3D, they didn't leave anything on the table and set the bar high for what's expected and possible with the future. Maybe it's just me, and I'm thinking about it too much. But it's so neat picking out all the layers that make up feeling underwater. The muffled audio, the bubbles coming off of Link, sliding around and having slower animations, the reflections on the walls. Take any one of these away and the illusion would be lost. That's what we all gotta start calling our engagement partners. Screw fiance. Oh hey everybody, we just got engaged. This here is my dude Rudo. And it wasn't just the size of the temple that made it so confusing. That would have been enough on its own, but having to raise and lower the water level. Oof. Still a win though, because of how crazy awesome it was for the time. Notice when we pass the tree, our reflection in the water disappears, and remember what Sheik said? Clear water surface reflects growth. A foreshadow. <laughs> to fighting our dark selves. Dark Link is low-key kind of my favorite boss in the game. The way he reflects all of our attacks, jumps up on our blade just to show me that I've gotta win the sauce, and how his hearts will match however many we've collected to this point. Originally, I was going to say fighting our dark selves would be cooler in Ganon's castle, the pinnacle of corruption, or even the forest temple, a place where we grew up and failed to protect. But it's actually perfect here. A reflection is always flipped, mirrored opposite. Link being the hero he is, his doppelganger, is just pure evil. Would it kind of work better in the spirit temple? I want you to hear my arguments about that. Probably. But water it reflects. So, there you go. We also meet our fiancé again here, and if you're going to be devoting yourself to another, then you first need to conquer your own inner demons first. This fight is also just hard. Definitely up there as the hardest in the game. We actually died and had to go gear up for it. Getting magic and two fairies just so we could cheese it. Because five minutes of slashing wasn't working and you know damn well I wasn't going to do the boss run back to him more than once. A neat effect that I'm sure blew all our asses when you first saw it back in 1998. Guess I haven't talked about the hookshot at all. It's great to have a ranged weapon with infinite ammo. You may have noticed I kind of breezed through the water temple and that's because there really isn't too much going on. And just like the previous ones, it's not worth either our time to go through a reach for wind like the water spouts you could run on being cool or the neat grapple stairs. Cool, yes, but we got bigger fish to shoot a long shot at. 
since we just re-met our dude Rudo, fitting that the boss is quite phallic. Hey, Command Grabs are cheating. It's only fitting that probably the worst boss is in the worst temple. All just annoying and hard. Unlike this boss. Just like Link and all the other sages have to sacrifice what they desire for the greater good and their responsibilities. Something I'm sure us adults are far too familiar with. The melody for the Shadow Temple ends off on this dissonant note that just feels uncomfortable to listen to. And for a place as creepy as that, say it with me everybody, fitting. It's really strange turning back to young Link and seeing everything is okay, yet knowing their eternal fate. It's a good reminder for us on what we're fighting for. We've got to turn into young Link to get to the bottom of the well. Mechanically, because there's the small hole, and thematically, as it's always children that are said to fall down wells in towns like these. And Link must prove his courage again with this cliche. And this corruption in the well, along with the Shadow Temple, exists back in Link's child timeline. These terrible things don't exist just because of Ganon's rule. It's always not been a very clean-cut place, Hyrule. And it's important as Link is slowly losing his innocence being 17 that he experiences this as a child and realizes it was all just under the surface the entire time. And down here, we gotta face some of the grossest, creepiest enemies just to make things worse. Also, f*** this area for all the false floors. But I get it. We're looking for the lens of truth, and as Link, as a kid, can't see the truth as well as maybe old Link can. But it's a child that retrieves it for him, so it could also be said that there is wisdom and a more innocent form of truth when you look at the world through a child's eyes. I also love the camera angles between both ages. With young Link, we've got a closer lower angle making the entire world around us look scarier and imposing versus when we're all grown up. Oh, the Shadow Temple. Definitely the scariest of all the temples, and coming off the Water Temple's tranquil vibe, it makes a statement. Especially considering this text. Everything in this temple wasn't the work of Ganondorf, but of the Hyrule Royal Family, you know. The one we're working with, it gives this story that was black and white some much needed shades of gray. Hover boots, they sound way cooler than they actually are, but do make for some really tense moments when platforming. The music for the temple is also super unnerving. First, we've got this constant bongo, foreshadowing the end boss, and also the male choir just sounds like tortured moans of all the souls that perish down here. This totally would have freaked me out if I was like five or six playing this. Holy crap, you are creepy as sh Basically my reaction to seeing the Shadow Temple for the first time. After going through the miasma that was the Water Temple, ironic use of the word, I know, the Shadow Temple is much more linear and a welcome palate cleanser. There is some added complexity through using the Lens of Truth though that can get confusing if not used properly. It's super cool as well that we use something called a Lens of Truth in this temple. We're seeing the ugly underbelly of Hyrule and the old rulers tried burying this history so deep that we need some magic item just to see it all. <laughs> you didn't think we'd go to the whole game and not win? Hey! Nation, right? That's been a part of my vocabulary for as long as I can remember, and y'all know I've never even played this game till now, so that says something about Ocarina. It makes sense why we fight Stalfos in the Forest Temple. According to Fado, a Stalfos is created when someone gets lost in the Lost Woods, but here, well, I like that theme of Lost. Hyrule used to be Lost, having a use for a place such as this. I like to headcanon that these Stalfos used to be torturers here punished for their misdeeds. You know, times have changed with this game being rated E for everyone, and yet the Shadow Temple and Great Fairy exist in it. And to match the scariest temple, we've got a grotesque monster with its head and hands cut off from its body. Interestingly, this is the only boss we don't use our newly acquired item to defeat. And why would we need it anyways? Bago Bago is safe to say the easiest of the temple bosses. Now, I can't help but just imagine Ganon playing this little tiny ocarina and how silly that would look. This gives me PTSD about Shadow of the Colossus. Gerudo Fortress flips everything we expected from a level in Ocarina. No puzzles this time around. Instead, our puzzle is how do I sneak past these Gerudo guards and battle these Gerudo thieves? We've finally made it to the final temple. The Spirit Temple has got the most going on thematically among all the temples. And it all got my brain going when looking at the medallion Niburu gives us at the end. It looks like a yin and yang symbol, a symbol representing balance and its duality. First, we've got Nubura herself being a Gerudo, but denouncing Ganon's actions and rebelling from him, also showing us that not all the Gerudo are bad like Ganon, this culture having light and dark, just like the Hylians. And coming right after the Shadow Temple, we saw a location of darkness amongst our good guys. The Spirit Temple has become a base of operations for Ganon, once a place of light and worship now being used to spread darkness and subjugation. You can really feel the strength difference between Young Link and Old Link. This being the first soft host we fight as him, and then later, the bitch of a fight of Iron Knuckle just being so f hard. Now, people are starting to recognize young Link as a grown man through all these deeds. Sounds awesome, but it's actually quite sad. A 10-year-old boy being seen and treated as if he's grown. Something we all wanted as kids until we finally grew up. Back on that duality mirror theme, this temple has two specific dungeon items to it. We also have to do this temple as old and young Link. 
The temple also has two statues, one outside in the light and one inside in the dark, comparatively speaking. Then we've got the mirror shield, which obviously fits the theme because duh, I think God of War learned a thing or two from this section. When I figured out what I had to do, I couldn't believe that a game that came out in 1998 would be able to pull off something like reflecting light. And also this just teaches us how to use the shield properly for when it comes time for the boss. If you check the map, you'll also notice that the temple is almost perfectly mirrored as well. I'm telling you guys, it's literally everywhere in this temple. I mean, just look at the map. Finally, you're facing off with some Gerudos that don't have respect for Link, calling him Kid, even in his adult form. Capping off all our duality mirror theme, we've got the twins, first being separate, with opposite elements, and then later becoming one, but still split visually. This is definitely up there as one of the more creative boss fights. Even today, it kind of blows my mind that the N64 had the computing power to do something like this. <laughs> Gross. Anyone with siblings knows this is exactly what it's like to fight with them. Ironic because of the role of Majora's Mask. And the theme of balance, duality, and mirrors is all over this game, not just in the Spirit Temple. Most importantly, it's present in the Triforce, needing a balanced heart to obtain the true force. <laughs> Well, that's the last thing I ever expected from Sheik. Every story gonna have a plot test, right? And with all this duality, Zelda literally had to become my dude for a while just to hide from Ganon. You're trying to tell me we did all that just to make a pride bridge? <laughs> I'm kidding, I know we needed the sages to break the berries and seal Ganon. Straight up looking like Satan's suckle. So the final dungeon is basically just an all-stars version of Ocarina of Time as a whole. We revisit each of the temples in a way once again for the final time, having to use everything we've learned and gathered to complete it. It's also bisected by the spokes and the tower climb. The spokes are nothing but a puzzle gauntlet, and then the tower being a combat-focused one. We've got to prove that we've mastered every mechanic of this game before we can face off against Ganondorf. I think Nintendo knew how annoying the Water Temple was and said, f*** it, let's just do ice. But also it makes better sense with it being Ganon who froze over Zora's domain. Each section of the temple puzzles have some kind of timed portion. It's like a pseudo way of raising the stakes about time running out for Zelda. And they do not go easy on us for this final gauntlet. Like, I died to these fools, which would also make me a fool. And after everything we've been through, we finally made it to the big man himself. And honestly, I think it might just be because of the games we've been playing recently, but not often does the final boss feel as climactic as Ganondorf does here. Between his laughing, domineering presence and just how much work it took to get to this fight, it's very impactful. Nintendo also takes Navi away from us, making it solely our job to take him down. Bringing back the Phantom Ganondorf mechanics, but dialing it up to 11. I swear we could go back and forth for like 15 times before finally having him break. And straight up, the cloth physics on that cloak were way ahead of its time. Just one more time had to call us kid. Not even when beaten can he show us some respect. Now that's a bad dude. And right after Zelda demeans him, calling him pitiful man. Telling us that where true power really lies is that in the courage of children. Funnily enough, if you had a cracked pirated version of the game, Zelda would leave you behind and you wouldn't be able to finish the game. After going through everything, just a big middle finger from Nintendo. <laughs> Love to figure out the real final boss. Like, you'd be lying if you said you weren't disappointed having to do the same boss over again for the final one, but nope. The Triforce of Power isn't something to be taken lightly. And this is proof that absolute power corrupts absolutely. Oops, totally forgot that this was Ganon, and before was Ganondorf. <laughs> oh well. Bet I already got some comments correcting me. Now that's an Avengers lever threat, I mean final boss. Ganon's big now, we've lost our sword, but at least we've got Navi on our side this time. And thank God for it, because this fight would have been pretty rough without Navi. I like that there isn't one right way to do this fight, too. You can use any weapon to defeat him. It was a bit of a buzzer beater, but we did it! It's kind of awesome that Zelda is not just some damsel. She's right there fighting alongside us all game, and even in the end, when Ganon is releasing his full power, she stays and fights with us. It's the weapon that links old and young Link together, that delivers the final blow to Ganon. The essence of corruption that forced Link to grow up so fast. Even in our victory, it really isn't one. He swears that he will return, and he still holds the Triforce of Power, thus hinting at the endless cycle that pervades Zelda. Not often do we get facial animations in this game, but when we do, they freaking hit. Zelda knowing what is to happen to Link, sending him back, having all that shame in her face. Everyone loves a dance party ending, right? This is when the tragedy of this game really starts to sink in. First, Navi has fulfilled their purpose and now leaves Link without as much as a goodbye. This means that Link can never go back to the forest. He can never return to his childhood and all his friends. And it's confirmed that the hero shade we meet in Twilight Princess is, in fact, this Link who eventually went back to the forest to look for his Kokiri got lost and became a Stelphos. After losing his childhood and saving all of Hyrule, he isn't rewarded for any of it. And this is why Ganondorf's name as King of Thieves is so perfect, because at the end of both timelines that are created, Ganon is defeated, but he robbed Link of the best years of everyone's lives, our childhood. And because of Link being sent back in time with all the knowledge of Ocarina of Time, no one remembers him, what he did for them and sacrificed for them. 
And that's kind of a crazy way to end it if we didn't have any future games to play. Because that ending makes us assume Link tells Zelda what he did the first time around. And round and round we go with that endless cycle, constantly stuck. Ocarina of Time will forever be a masterpiece. Forever one of the best games of all time. No matter how dated some gameplay elements may be, or old and sharp the graphics are, and I don't mean sharp as in crisp, this game will always hold a special place in all of our hearts. For many of us, it was the first 3D game we ever played, first ARPG we ever played, first Zelda game. For me, it was only one of those. This was my first Zelda game. My god, did I love every second of it. One more time, thank you to my good friend Justin for helping me understand what this game truly means to everyone so I could write this video in a manner that relates to those memories from when we were kids. Even playing it now for the first time, I felt like a kid again. Having my big brother watch over me and help me through the sections when I'd get stuck, and begging him and getting excited for him to come over so we can keep playing some more Zelda. I couldn't have asked for a better experience with this game, and I can't wait to dive into the future games, because Pandora's box is open now, folks. More Zelda and more Nintendo games are on the table after this one. If this experience was anything, it was a reminder of what games mean to people, mean to us, how they have changed all of our lives. Without video games and this channel, I don't know what I would be doing. And playing through this really did make me feel like a kid again. And I don't think there's any higher praise I can give Ocarina of Time than that. It's a game about growing up and losing your childhood, yet I found mine once again through playing. Drive the speed limit, drink some water, and love one another. Pizza.